All right, we're updated agenda, and our first witness up is David Schur, Assistant Attorney General, Vermont Attorney General's Office. Um, is here to speak to um, S5, Miscellaneous, miscellaneous Cannabis Regulation Procedures. David? Good morning, Senator. Good morning, committee. Uh, for the record, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. Morning. My understanding was that I am here to testify about the issue of advertising. Uh, and, yes. Uh, right. we, we are concerned about advertising. Got it. Thank you, Senator. And, and I do have a few comments I can make on the various proposals that came through the legislature last year. Ultimately, of course, the final legislation ended with a sort of directive to the control board and our office, uh, and I believe to the health department as well to work out a system of regulation. That's certainly something we are, we, uh, we're happy to be involved in last year. We're still happy with that outcome and happy to engage in that project. Uh, but if the committee would like to reconsider some of the legislation, legislative versions that pa uh, that were considered last year, I'm happy to give a brief overview well, of I'm, the legal issues. I was considering proposing an amendment that would have the House Government Operations version before it was changed on the floor to nothing um, or to no advertising. Um, sure. So let me... I, I would be... Uh, I was going to propose that the committee amend this S bill, S25 bill with the language that was approved by House Government Office. Senator, uh, Senator Childs, uh, Michelle. I'm <laughs> I just wanted to, um, uh, so I think last time we talked about S25, I then sent you a document that had all yep. the different advertising language, and I just wanted to check to make sure y'all had that. So if um, David wanted to comment on the language that you're uh, proposing, Senator Sears. It is in that. And if you don't have it, I can resend it to you and I'll send it. Probably copy. be better okay. off to resend it right now because okay. trying to find anything on my iPad while we're Zooming, okay. and some people only have phones. Um, sure. I'll email it to you right now and I'll email it also to Peggy <laughs> so Peggy can post it. And I made you co host, Michelle, if you want to share. I'm good. I don't want to. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt David. Uh, I just want to make sure y'all had language if he was going to comment on it. Right. So I, I don't have it yet, but we will. The power of the power of Zoom. Oh. I can't believe the email we get just while we take it out. Committee work. Right. Go, go ahead, David. I think you know the. Sure. Yeah. Th thank you, Senator. I, what I'll do is I'll give you the headline, give a brief overview of the law. I won't go into great detail in it, although I'm happy to answer more questions about it uh, and then uh, answer questions generally. You know, our brief headline is that we do believe that the version as passed by the House Government Operations Committee is something that we'd be on fairly solid ground defending if it were to be uh, become the subject of a lawsuit down the road. Um, I did consult with our Solicitor General who deals with First Amendment issues more often than I do. Uh, and we did go through those proposals and uh, did talk a bit about the applicable law. The committee, does know, I think, and, and should know that everything on this air, in this area is a little bit murky given the unusual status of the law in this case. Uh, we are dealing with something that's legal on the state level or will shortly be legal on the state level uh, and is illegal on the federal level, which um, makes everything a little bit less certain. But the general analysis that's used when you're talking about commercial speech in the United States is something called the Central Hudson Test. It lays out the groundwork by which courts analyze whether commercial speech is protected under the First Amendment or whether uh, it, it can be limited, lawfully limited. The Central Hudson Test has four prongs. The first prong of that test is whether it concerns, whether the speech concerns lawful activity and is not misleading. And that's not actually 
a First Amendment uh, inquiry. It's more just an inquiry about the, the nature of the speech and what it's addressing and how it's addressing it. After you pass that first law prong, so in other words, if, if you're talking about unlawful activity or if the acti or if the, or the speech is talking about uh, things in a misleading or untruthful way, then it can be banned. There's no First Amendment protection at all. But let's say we pass those two tests, it is lawful activity and it is not misleading. Then we go into a classic First Amendment balancing test, uh, um, kind of mid-level review. And the, the next three prongs are whether the asserted governmental interest is substantial, uh, whether the regulation directly advances that governmental interest, and whether the regulation is not more extensive than is necessary to serve that interest. And those are the uh, issues we look at in deciding whether speech is, or a court will look at in deciding whether speech can lawfully be regulated and the extent to which it can lawfully be regulated. Turning to the House Government Operations uh, proposal, the, which hopefully the committee will have or, or does have in front of it shortly. We looked through the prongs here and there's two things to think about. One is just applying the central Hudson factors to these uh, prongs. And the second is the broader issue about whether the central Hudson test will apply at all. Um, I'll, I'll go through the first one first, which is let's look at these prongs and think about how central, the central Hudson test applies. And I'm not gonna go into this in great detail. Again, I am happy to sort of look into the uh, answer specific questions about specific prongs. But I would say that as we look through this, certainly it's lawful to outlaw speech or you know, to ban speech that's deceptive, false or misleading. That's that first central Hudson test prong. Um, we think that uh, it's certainly a defensible position to say that you can limit uh, advertising regarding overconsumption uh, that promotes overconsumption. Um, we think it uh, is defensible under the central Hudson prongs to say that it, we shouldn't be representing that the use of cannabis has curative effects, um, especially in the commercial, not, you know, that we're talking about non-medical here, we're talking about commercial sales, uh, retail sales. We think that that is something that there is a governmental interest in, um, in not allowing for those types of representations to be made and, uh, and that this is, advances that interest and is sufficiently narrowly tailored. Um, again, offering a prize or award for uh, purchasing <coughs> cannabis or something like that. Again, we're trying not to, um, have this product, which does have concerns about its health effects, be um, over overly be promoted in ways that don't that feel improper and uh, may pro may promote overconsumption. We think that's in line with that concept, and similar with the offering of free samples, um, depicting a person under twenty one. Clearly, the government has an interest in preventing <laughs> consumption by young people. The health issues on that are very well documented. Um, same with number seven, appealing to a person's under 21. The subsection C in this proposal regarding the percentage of the audience that's reasonably expected to be under 21 years of age, I understand that that is borrowed from Colorado regulations. Uh, the percentage is slightly different. Um, I'm not sure if the percentage as a practical matter is gonna make a, a, a huge amount of difference in terms of how the analysis plays out. But again, this is clearly something that relates to uh, not preventing consumption by young people, which in which I think uh, it could clearly be demonstrated to a court that there is a strong governmental interest in uh, preventing that. Um, and same with uh, having warnings be on the labels. Um, that's something that's also allowable uh, in terms of subsection E, submitting the board to the board um, uh, proposals for advertising prior to the dissemination of the advertisement. Normally in First Amendment law, this sort of prior restraint, in other words, have, make uh, allowing the government or having the government look at speech before it's given, normally that's quite disfavored. Uh, but in the commercial speech, 
world, it is allowable. And I would say circuit law isn't, the law as it's been developed has not been uh, especially clearly developed on this, but the central Hudson case itself contemplates the idea that prior restraint or this type of prior restraint, prior approval uh, is allowable. Um, so clearly the, the precedent is there to support something like this. So that's a brief rundown through the provisions. Uh, again, we feel comfortable defending this in court if it should, if it should get there. The overarching question is, does the central Hudson test apply at all? In other words, you know, because this is illegal under federal law, um, does that mean that the first prong of the central Hudson test doesn't even get passed? And essentially that would give Vermont carte blanche, uh, open, uh, an open field to, to ban as much as they want or limit as strictly as they want to limit. And I think that is an open question. There have been two cases recently, um, one in Montana, one in Washington state, they came down on opposite sides of this question, but we certainly, it is our read of the law that we are in a more secure legal position to limit as opposed to ban uh, commercial speech related to cannabis. And it would be, we are more comfortable going into court defending a limitation as opposed really? to defending a ban. So given that analysis, uh, Again, going back to the headline here, we believe that this is uh, fine language. We are ready to uh, defend it if it should come to that. I will note for the court, I did reach out actually to some um, colleagues in Colorado who have worked on the Colorado regulations, which do contain the percentage limitation just to learn how that's been working in, in practice. And the reality is that there really haven't been uh, many lawsuits brought up in Colorado at all on this. Basically, the retailers and other folks involved in the industry have accepted the regulations and moved forward within them without challenging them. There was a challenge early on in back in, I think, 2015 or 16 that came from publish publishers and they challenged the advertising limitations in federal court those were thrown out for lack of standing. So the merits of the issue, whether or not, in fact, these did have First Amendment implications and what they were, those were never decided by the court. Uh, and none of the retailers, none of the folks who would have had standing at, under that ruling, or at least the court indicated probably would have had standing under that ruling, nobody ever seems to have brought a case. Um, and I think what I've understood from my colleagues out there is that the industry seems to have accepted the regulations and decided that it was a better thing just to work within them as opposed to try to go to court and risk uh, an, an opinion that, that was adverse and sort of the unpredictable outcomes that come I'm, from those uh, sorts of court battles. I do have one question, uh, David. In the House version F, the board may charge and collect fees for review of advertisements. Uh, that's a little odd. I'm not sure that's appropriate, actually. I, I, I don't know where else would we do something like that. I, you know, know, I mean, do, we, do we charge mattress companies <laughs> for a final liquidation sale that isn't really a final liquidation sale? In terms of it's speaking to this, just from... How many times have you seen on a wall at a mattress company final liquidation sale I mean, it's gone on for 27 years um, I, I don't Do we I don't charge think, a fee for that I don't think I have seen that example in particular I'll speaking to this from the first amendment analysis I'm not sure that this actually fits in neatly with that I think that the the state has I think in, in considering an amendment I think we should take mm -hmm. out F and Senator, certainly we would have no, no, I think we'd have no position on that really. I don't think that implicates the First Amendment issues one way or the other. I think that's more about what the state has the power to uh, do in terms of imposing fees on um, people who are, you know, certainly in other instances, the state does impose fees for regulatory reviews. Um, that's, that's fairly common. So 
I, I, I don't think that that has any real First Amendment implication, but I understand there might be other policy issues that the committee wants to consider on that. Uh, what I'd like to do is next Tuesday consider them, not next Tuesday, obviously, but be the 9th of March. We would consider amendments on Tuesday the 9th, Michelle, to the bill. Um, we've obviously had a number proposed and um, we can let people in if we have questions that are amendments, but I um, and, and other witnesses who may want to um, and we can talk about that, Peggy, but uh, it's more markup of amendments to the bill. S25, so we can move it along. Um, it's going to have to go to finance anyways or appropriations. Or not. Um, I wish it would go to agriculture. So... Any questions for David? Senator, I just wanted to make, if, if there, if this is okay, I want to make one other very quick point about sure. the litigation stance here, which is that, as I mentioned, our office is more comfortable and feels like we're on more solid ground defending a limitation as opposed to a ban. The other thing I just wanted to point out about that is that if we end up getting into a legal argument about whether specific provisions within this um, lim statute uh, do or do not withstand First Amendment scrutiny. It may be that one or two of them get struck down, but it's likely that at least several, if not most of these, we do believe will be upheld. Um, so it leaves the state in a more protected position to be arguing about a set of limitations. By contrast, if we are arguing about an absolute ban, and the absolute ban were to be struck down by the courts, there would be no limitation remaining on advertising uh, for the cannabis industry. And that we believe would leave the state in a much worse position with respect to the various public health and public safety uh, concerns that are trying to be addressed by limiting advertising. So that's another reason why we believe it's a better position for us to be in to be defending a limitation. A set of that's that's basically why we refuse to adopt the House version, the House amended version that had been amended on the floor by the Donahue Amendment, because we felt that it put us in a really bad position. Uh, I can't remember what was in the governor's sign non-signing letter. I guess we call it a non-signing letter. So, thank you, David. Thank you. Appreciate your being here. Uh, next, we'll go to an old uh, friend who used to be uh, here very often uh, back when we were eating, eat, meeting non COVID style in the State House. Tyler Nash, welcome back. Hey, everybody. How are you? Nice to um, see you. Good. Nice to see you all. I'm glad that I was finally able to take part in this committee with um, some actual concrete title rather than just this ambiguous student activist role that I seem to have been acting for the past couple of years. Do you have somebody else with you today or? Yeah, uh, Blaine, uh, she was having trouble with the link, uh, but she should oh, be okay. now. Uh, and she, I think, is going to lead our testimony off. Um, okay. So. Um, let me, uh, I'm finding my agenda. And yeah, Blaine, um, let me see. Okay, so while we're waiting for Blaine to jump in, um, uh, <clears throat> you so wanna, what is your actual title? I am a uh, public policy and research analyst for the Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Department for the city of Burlington. Great. Say that three times fast. No, I can't even say it <laughs> once fast. <laughs> You're a research analyst. Yeah, are you surprised? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not. Used to do research for this committee. Absolutely. And analyze things. Oh. Um, if you wanted to introduce, um, I think you know everybody on the committee, Skyler, maybe you can introduce 
Your, yeah. No, this is uh, this is this is Blaine, my partner in crime at the uh, REIB department in the city of Burlington, um, it, but also somebody that keeps me in check on a daily basis from just you know, <laughs> up the way that I acted up with you all. Uh, <laughs> And so, you know, we wanted to come here today. I, I did get excited in telling her that we were going to be testifying in my home committee today. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, everybody be nice to her because I've been talking you all up for the past couple of days. <laughs> so maybe you could um, just briefly update us on your, um, uh, the role that um, I wasn't aware that Burlington had a social equity, inclusion and belonging office of and that there were <clears throat> policy research analysts. So can you, either one of you tell us a little bit about this position? Yeah, well, uh, Mayor Weinberger created the position uh, by appointing our director, Taisha Green, um, a year ago now, which seems kind of crazy to think about. Uh, and then um, our two positions were added and we were subsequently hired. And so we really, in our department, focus on uh, policy. We've done a few programs in terms of uh, BIPOC grants related to COVID uh, relief for small businesses and organizations. Um, but mostly we're focusing on policy, um, whether that's creating new policies to center racial equity um, in city departments and policies and practices or fixing ones that exist and are kind of missing the mark. Um, so that's included, you know, uh, cultural, uh, organizational cultural analysis, um, you know, policy proposals around procurement equity, housing equity, um, basically making sure that uh, we are kind of the hub in the city for generating race-centered um, policies and practices. Uh, so I think, you know, something that we're really proud of and thankful for the mayor and the city council leading on and, and hoping to uh, kind of make our mark here uh, statewide as well. Okay. Well, you're here testifying on S25. Uh, Elaine, you want to lead off? Or? Yeah, I'll go. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Blaine Intense, as Skylar said. Uh, we are partners in crime, and we have reflecting roles. I'm also a public policy and research analyst for the City of Burlington's Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Office. Um, we're really starting off with the general, um, to continue on a conversation you all had a little earlier around where is the language on race specifically in, in this bill. Um, and I, and I, think, I think that the, we would kind of echo that, that uh, having race specific language helps us actually reduce the harm that, that has been inflicted by marijuana drug laws. So where our first argument here is that and nowhere in the bill do we d directly address that black and also some brown communities have been disproportionately harmed by marijuana laws. And therefore, we should be repairing that harm through this bill by including race specific language. Uh, I think you're this starting Zoom meetings. Social equity groups. Um, am I back? Yeah. Kind of. Okay. Okay. Well, if I do cut out, Skylar, you can take over for me. Yeah. This is not a good ad for Burlington Telecom. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do something about that next. Uh, go ahead if you can. Yeah. Um, so we're just going to echo the argument that we should have race specific policies in here. Um, and to continue on that, as well as understanding that black and brown communities, but specifically black communities have been harmed by this bill. We have members being taken out of black communities due to incarceration from, from um, uh, drug policies and drug laws that we have. And those communities are then being harmed and still being harmed as we phase out of um, a, a state in which marijuana is illegal. So those communities as well need to kind of experience that um, repair that can come from the revenues from this bill. So that's our second argument here is we're, we're hoping that there's something in here that can that can address the harm of the communities themselves um, and addressing perhaps tax revenue going back into black and brown communities um, across Vermont. Can I, uh, um, one of the confusions I have is there's Mark Hughes introduced a amendment today, as did um, last week, uh, Senator Rahm. And um, 
So as the committee tries to put this bill together, um, are there specific things in um, either of those amendments, if you're familiar with them, that you would like us to consider? Um, or do you have amendments of your own? Yeah, um, if I may, I think on page three in the definitions, um, let me pull this up. And, and which version are we looking at? Let me see. And I'm specifically speaking on, um, let's see, Mark had introduced yep. his okay. amendment. Yeah, so we have, let me see, okay. page three, we go into, uh, um, we go into talking about the cannabis social equity programs and the definitions that we use. And I think specifically there, we need to define what we mean by these groups that are historically disproportionately harmed by um, marijuana drug laws. And, yeah. and in research, both in, in Vermont, in Chittenden County, in Burlington, but across the nation, we see that that group is specifically black people and, and adjacent also some other BIPOC communities. And that needs to be specifically put into this bill if we want to repair any of the harm that has been done in the past, you know, several decades. Okay. Senator White. Can I just ask a question of that about, because um, I think in Vermont, another group that was disproportionately affected was um, poor rural kids. And um, I, I think we need to, we need to address that also. Yeah. Senator Benning. Um, good morning to you both. I'm wondering, Philip had brought up earlier the, the fact that race was absent from the document. And the more I thought about it, I, I thought that is actually probably a very smart way of proceeding here because I don't know if anybody's done any research, but if you put the word race into, or any particular race into the equation, I don't know if anybody's done any research on the equal protection clause of the constitution and how that might apply. Um, I know that there are large areas of the state that have an extremely small uh, BIPOC community. And yet there have been people in those areas who have been <clears throat> affected by being arrested for this. Um, and I'm not sure how to resolve that with language that doesn't run us afoul somehow, or provide an excuse for this bill to be voted down. So I just wanna make sure if there's research out there that has yet to be done about the equal protection clause and how it would apply, I would hope that somebody would follow up on that. Thoughts? We've kind of interrupted your testimony and, and gone afoul, which is something we often do, but if you have any thoughts on that, and I think the line is frozen or unfrozen now, and that's, she's having a hard time with the technical difficulties. I think she, oh, I was just going to say, I think she may be frozen, but what I would say to that is I think it's something to, to ask a question about. I think our position uh, in the REIB department in the city is that um, too often when we cast this wide net without being surgical about intention, sometimes we can miss that mark. And I think, you know, uh, Senator Baruth brought this up earlier is that if if our intention is to help and aid and, and be reparative towards uh, black and brown communities, BIPOC communities that um, history has shown us, unless we name that and are extremely intentional about that, it generally doesn't happen um, when we try to cast this wide net to, to serve all of those purposes at the same time. I just wanna make sure Skylar, since you've now identified yourself as somebody who's performing research I'm sending out the challenge. I'd love to see the research and just make sure we're not providing some kind of a stumbling block. Uh, and I'm not trying to suggest that I would vote against the bill if you went with that uh, suggested addition. I'm trying to make sure that we cover all bases moving forward. Uh, you bring up a good point. You bring up a really good point. Senator Baruth. Um, I, I mean, maybe I'm missing something here, but 
we've had grant programs for minority owned businesses for yeah. how, how long, you know, like yeah. 50 years. It's hard for me to imagine that if we were to do a similar thing here, we would be in any kind of legal danger. Um, so I, I take the point, I guess, that there might be uh, some House members or some Senate members who might be less likely to vote for the bill if it mentions race or uses race specific language. But I would just echo Schuyler's point. If, for instance, Representative China's bill, I read through that there's no mention of race. You could wind up with a program that ultimately puts out $10 million in, in funds and then find out that 1% of that went to the BIPOC community, at which point we would say, oh, dopey us. We should have, um, we should have cast our net in a, in a much narrower fashion. So, um, you know, this is not breaking any kind of new ground or, um, you know, I thought that were, is what we were engaged in is trying to, um, to target people who had been targeted. Well, the, there have been, been challenges on quotas um, in uh, universities and so forth. You set up a quota. I don't see this as setting up a quota. This is setting up a grant program that would be available just as we just did a, correct me if I got the wrong number, $10 million grant to um, women and minority owned businesses. Right. Um, well, I just want to make sure, guys. My name is at the very first list of, of list of names on this bill. Because your name's want, Benning. That's right. But I want to make sure I can cover all my bases and say we've managed to delve into this question. Uh, the clause in the Constitution is pretty specific. I don't want it to become a stumbling block somehow. So. Skyler, I'm, I'm anxious to see your new research skills. <laughs> I will just mention the quota system is where we've had trouble. Uh, so Senator White is anxious. So I appreciate, Skyler, your comment about being surgical <clears throat> about this instead of casting too broad a net. But I do really believe that we need to make sure that we, um, that a dis, I, I, I believe that a disproportionately impacted community in Vermont was poor rural kids. And if we, if we don't say that, we've, we've, I mean, that's pretty surgical, but, and, and I don't suppose we need to say poor rural kids, but there, th those in many communities, those were the significantly impacted um, people. Well, I think you say that by saying um, something about race, but you also say something about the, those disproportionately affected populations, including. If I, if I could, uh, Senator Sears, I think that I, you know, Senator White, that's a, a great point. And I think that that's something we can't lose sight of, particularly you know, there's this national movement where like, there's no argument that nationally and, and you know, comprehensively, it's been the BIPOC community that right. is predominantly, but we also have to remain specific to Vermont. And so that's a good point. I guess my last kind of comment on this would be that if we're taking up this bill in recognition that uh, systemic racism has contributed to causing this problem, um, that tells us how surgical we need to be in terms of putting constraints on that system to actually fix it. Because if we you know, leave the system to fix the problem, um, without those constraints, then that systemic racism is going to continue yeah. to go up, even when our good intentions to solve that problem without those constraints. And direction, I guess, would be a better word than constraints. Mm -hmm. Are we back in anything else? I, mean, no, I, I think Blaine might be frozen again. I think, unfortunately, she is frozen. And um, no, I can uh, say a lot about Burlington Telecom, <laughs> Senator I, I can uh, I can just bring up her last point. Um, and it kind of goes along with this general conversation that we're having, which is that and oftentimes it can be really hard and uncomfortable um, to get specific uh, when talking about these things. Rather than saying marginalized, it's easier. it's much easier to say uh, and give preference to marginalized communities, social equity, 
rather than being specific in our language and saying black people. Uh, but that, you know, as we move forward in this movement, that we can't shy away from naming who we're actually trying to help um, with these things, whether it's cannabis, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, sentencing reform, that let's get in the habit of being really specific um, and taking on that challenge of, of being specific and saying, you know, black people, black and brown people, BIPOC people, rather than generalized terms like marginalized communities. Um, you know, because it's not in every case, all marginalized communities that have been harmed by these drug laws surrounding cannabis. Uh, and so I think along with this, you know, ongoing conversation that in a lot of ways, the way that this bill reads, uh, you know, we're not necessarily seeking to provide racial equity. Uh, and so if that's what we really want to do, then we should be specific about that. I think Blaine's back. Yeah. <laughs> so. I'm back. I hope you can hear me. I have nothing to add on Skylar's point. That was exactly the point I was trying to make. Thanks, Skylar. Senator White. I, I don't know how <clears throat> detailed we want to be about around parameters here, but what what we heard from, um, I just got done interviewing people who have applied to be on the Cannabis Control Board. And what we heard from almost all of them, and they were an amazing group of people for the most part, that had done a lot of research and knew what was happening around the country. And one of the things that we heard was that the um, <clears throat> in most of the states, the social equity um, provision of their law or their rules was really um, sounded great and was good, but the implementation sucked. Um, excuse me, that, that's a technical <laughs> term. The, the, and, that, and that what they found in some cases were that, that um, corporations or companies had set themselves up and then nominally named a person of color or a woman as the owner or the head of it w without it being that being really true. And, and so they, we, I don't know how specific we need to be about the parameters and how, what the details are, but we need to be aware of that when we implement the policies. I agree with Senator White. Well, if I could, I've got um, three other things that I just wanna bring up. Oh, yeah, please. Um, so when we're talking about um, the licenses, I think a recommendation that we would have is that we want to, uh, you'll notice a trend here in our recommendations, ensure that a guaranteed percentage of the licenses go to black people that were specifically targeted by the criminal justice system uh, with both local and federal bills. And you know, a part of this, I think earlier, um, might be a little bit harder to accomplish in a good way because as you know, we're moving forward on this, we're also moving forward with trying to expunge and seal, um, you know, records that are come have come about as a result of the criminalization of cannabis, right? And so then, alongside of that, it might also be harder to find people, black people, um, any people that have been specifically, um, you know, harmed by the criminalization of cannabis. Um, but it is still something to keep in mind as we move forward uh, in terms of <laughs> licenses. Um, and then also uh, with the low interest rate uh, loans, we would recommend that uh, for some period of time um, that the loans be interest free, uh, whether that would be for a period of a year or two years before then introducing that fixed uh, low rate on, on the loans. It, the only problem with everything having to do with money, there's no income right now um, because there's nothing. We don't even have the board established. So. <clears throat> Senator White, I think, made the recommendation that we may look at appropriation, similar to what we're doing to try to set up the board with pre-funding. So um, what, what you would almost have to pre-fund um, in order to get, get it going, because there is no income right now. I would, would add another, um, I think limiting to all of our drug laws were aimed at certain groups, not just cannabis, but all the drug laws. Um, 
and if you you look uh, historically, I don't want to limit it to just those impacted by cannabis laws. I mean, there's evidence that um, Senator White will not like the term hippie, but you know we we have the recordings of uh, President Nixon um, deciding to go after certain group. Um, Politically, was politically popular to go after that group and not legalize marijuana back in the 1960s. So I, I think you have the evidence it wasn't just. <clears throat> so, and, and that included um, a racial component of all of those laws. Certainly, uh, they go after certainly black musicians or one group that certainly get targeted. Uh, I can remember that growing up. Um, can't think of the guy's name. He was a drummer. Um, but they went after him uh, specifically on, on, on drugs. Uh, I wish my memory were better on some of these things. Do you remember? Who, me? No, you don't remember. <laughs> Anybody who's eligible for I could research COVID shots right now. Maybe you should research, seriously, uh, the music industry back in the 60s and how um, biased some of the work, what the persons of color particularly um, were. Well, there were a lot of rhythm and blues people out of the South that were targeted. Um, well, I think Robert Johnson and um, Lead Belly and a whole bunch of people were. No, there were also I groups that I can remember a group that I was familiar with out of Roxbury, Mass. Yeah, we lived there. Oh, God. All right. Anything else, Skylar or Bela? Uh, that that concludes our prepared points, but you know I'm always willing to uh, continue to go back and forth and answer any questions related or otherwise. Oh, how's things at the university? I wouldn't know. I haven't been on campus in months. Don't ask. <laughs> don't ask. Don't tell. <laughs> Although I would say, that, I would say <laughs> that you know you've been picking on Burlington Telecom. I am a Burlington Telecom uh, customer, and I have not frozen one time here. And that's not to throw Blaine under the bus, but more to support. Uh, our local utility. Okay. Well, I, for full disclosure, I'm on Burlington Telecom too right now. Um, so we're, we're at two thirds efficacy. <laughs> well, it may so, be that Blaine lives in the middle of the street. <laughs> I was told, seriously, speak about craziness of our telecommunications industry. I was told that I couldn't get, at the time it was AT&T, um, internet because I lived in the middle of my street. If I was on one end or the other, the service was good enough for that. Even though they had sent me an offer and I had, had you know, already paid for the offer. And that's how I ended up with Comcast, your internet provider. So you may live in the middle of the street, not on one end or the other. I, I still don't know if that was true or not, but that's what they told me. Can I comment on something Belaine said? Yeah. Um, we, we often hear people talk I'll... about colleagues or um, <laughs> co-workers or whatever, but you use the term reflecting roles. And I just love that because it, it just, it was like, <clears throat> there's a, a mirror here and we're both doing it. I, I, I've never heard that before and I liked it. I'm glad. I'm glad. Thank you. Well, I think, um, no, go ahead. No, I'm just going to thank you both for being here and uh, sorry about the technical difficulties. But, um. No, thank you for having us. Yeah, I think the technical difficulties are on my side. And I actually, I do have Comcast. So, oh, wow. I don't know. Wow. I don't know Burlington Telecom under the bus quite yet. You should have had Burlington Telecom. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'll give Comcast a call after this. <laughs> well, um, Anything else? Michelle, can you join us for a moment? You're still here. Maybe she's fixing her pipe. She had um, burst pipes in her basement. Oh, geez. She had what? Homer may have 
her basement pipes burst. Oh. She had a plumber coming at some time, and the plumber may be here now. What I would like to do is, is next Tuesday, take this up again and start to go through. This is Tuesday the 9th, not next Tuesday. Tuesday the 9th, and go through some of the amendments. In the meantime, Senator White, oh, there's Michelle. In the meantime, Senator White has uh, an amendment from the Government Operations Committee, or will have. We, we are going to spend Friday um, focusing on this, so we will have something for you by Tuesday. So what we need to do is, I've already alerted people that this needs to go to finance and appropriations anyway. Um, so um, we may, do you want to take the bill, Senator White, or do you want to incorporate government? No, into I don't, our I, bill? I think that that's, that's I mean, I wish the time. bill would go to, I, I really wish the bill would go to agriculture. I asked Senator Starr yesterday and he um, indicated okay. he did not want it. Well, so we're going to uh, do it Friday and Tuesday. So we may have not finalized by Tuesday morning. I thought Jeffrey brought up a good point about current use and I'd like to see the amendment that we passed in the Senate on current use. About what? Here. Current yeah. use. Oh yeah, yeah. Because that is that that does become a problem for those who want to use their own farmland that's currently in current use for a larger plot. If I may, I just I want to give you one last thought before we hop off here and, and get okay. out of your way. It, it occurs to me that this may be the first time that I've spent time with you all without uh, either a suit jacket or a tie. And so I don't want you to think that I that you're you know, you all have lowered in importance at all or in esteem. <laughs> and I mind it just occurred to me and now I'm feeling really bad. So oh, I don't please. Although I'm Senator out. Benning, I believe, said. That your, your ears must them. have been ringing, Skylar, because I was commenting yesterday when I learned that you were coming. I said, I don't know where that man gets his suits. <laughs> Damn. I'd love to find out. I appreciate Well, I have to, we, we, you know, we can all go shopping uh, once that this COVID crisis is yeah. over because, you know, you can never have too many of them. And I got to make sure that I have a fresh one for the next time I show up for you all. I, I just said you went to former Senator McNeil's store down in Rutland. <laughs> and, and you might invite Clarence Davis too, because I've never seen anybody dress like Clarence. Well, I try to take a, he sets the bar for me. Okay. He's, he's, he's the pace, <laughs> the pacer buddy. So getting back to, thank you, Skylar, for that paid announcement. Um, <laughs> um, Let me get out of your ways. I'm causing trouble. No, 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 you, no, no, you, no, you're not. I just, I, I'm trying to think of what. Um, so, anyway, if you can resurrect that amendment on current use, um, so, I don't I'm know sorry. how to deal with the agriculture parts. I really don't. I think I, they've made great points, um, and I'd like to build them in. So can I ask a question about the current use, what you just said about you wanted an amendment on current use? Yeah, we had a provision in S-54 that I think Senator Pearson put in regarding mm -hmm. current use. And it was a larger amount, or maybe it's something we offered on the floor. I mean, um, Senator Pearson was the, was the one who pushed it. And it would have allowed Jeffrey brought it up in his testimony, or maybe it was Graham, I don't know which, <clears throat> regarding the limited size, the thousand square foot size for current use was um, problematic for many of the growers. And I wanted to go at least look at what we had put in S-54. It may have been a floor amendment from Senator Pearson or from agriculture, I can't remember. I think what it was is it was just in the back and forth negotiation during the conference uh, committee okay. on current use because the discussion of current use didn't come in until it was in ways and means uh, on right. the house side. And so your debate for conference was around how, you know, how much could be in current use. Uh, the house was opposed to taking and to, um, to doing current, to, to taking, I guess they didn't want to lose the tax revenue 
Um, and so I think what you guys settled on was that a thousand square feet or less could apply. It doesn't take, so if you have a thousand square feet and it's on a tract of 20 acres that is in current use, it only takes that small plot out of current use. It doesn't, doesn't take the whole prop, the, doesn't take the whole acreage out. So I can go back and see, and or now I talked to Senator Pearson about- Yeah, would you talk wanted? to Senator Pearson about what what we really wanted. I think we wanted to not have any impact on current use. Okay. <clears throat> so you just so if it's already in current use, you don't want it to come out of current use no matter I don't how want it big to come the out, no matter how big the field is. Okay. I think that was where we were at. You're right. It was probably negotiation. Right. And then what and is there other than the current use issue, is there anything else you need me to take well, I think we have. I, I, I can I throw out the the idea that I think that they had a good um, point about the um, the difference between in and outdoor, and that somehow the regulations are seem to be the same. So, if you're producing indoors, you can produce four crops a year. If you're producing outdoors, you can only produce one crop a year. But so the size, if we're putting some kind of a product cap on at all, we need to differentiate between in and out. I, that, I don't know where we go with that. And, I, and the other issue that they brought up was making an agricultural product. I don't think that'll fly at all because of the no, no regulations around grow. Um, or they don't comply with zoning or anything and don't pay any sales tax on any equipment for agricultural products. So I don't think that will fly. Jeanette, why would yeah. we get into a conversation about indoor versus outdoor when technically that would be, in my eyes, a rule that's developed by the board? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm fine um, having it be a rule because I, I think there's a lot of this that should be rule that's well, we can direct the board to develop size. You, you, did, you, did. you did in yeah, 164. We did. Okay, yeah. well. I'm fine with that. Well, I'm, all right. Okay, well, we'll pick up a, a week from Tuesday. So is there anything, I mean, I'll be with uh, Senate Government Operations uh, as they yep. do their work, and uh, Senator White, you guys are going to take up. Uh, we're not going to. We're not going to do it this afternoon. Yeah, Gail because, does email me, but tomorrow. Yeah, but, um, tomorrow, starting about one thirty. That's okay. all we'll do. And the topics that you're going to focus on. Well, I thought the that the vote, <clears throat> the um, issues around if there's issues around the board. Um, Senator Rahm's amendment and the committee wanted to hear the uh, 2% um, bill that just got sent to finance. They just wanted to hear. Okay, so can you have, the, uh, do you want to have an, Anthea in on that? Sure, and we'll, okay. we'll deal with those issues um, and then continue them on, on to next Tuesday. Okay, but Senator Sears, you're gonna keep the social equity discussion in yeah. judiciary, right? And so we'll just come back to your language yeah. that's in S25 and talk about if you want to make any tweaks to that or. Well, I'd like to incorporate as much of the use amendment as possible. Mm. So I would say um, that uh, it's, uh, it's going to need a lot of uh, work and hearings and testimony. There's some pieces there that um, are, around uh, one part of it doesn't have funding. Um, there's, I would just, I, I, we wouldn't, you would need to spend some time on it is what I would say. So, and um, you might wanna have Senate Economic Development weigh in because it's ACCD that's gonna be uh, doing the loans and the grants. And um, so just wanted to mention that. All right, let me take a 24 hours to think about this.
um, all right. Uh, yeah, let me take 24 hours to think about how much can we incorporate. But I, I don't know. I kind of like the idea of not being constricted by time. Good luck with that concept. I mean, we're not constricted by time if we don't want to have something passed out this year. There's no time constriction if we're willing to um, continue the conversation and not pass it this year. No, I, I did think Mark's point was well taken that in, in his groups and the other groups' minds, they've already waited um, a year past where they wanted to be. So if, if it's at all mm -hmm. possible, I would support uh, where I think Dick is going, which is trying to get as much of um, their amendments through this year as we can. That doesn't preclude right. what Jeanette is saying, which is we could continue the rest of it or what right. we don't have time for next year. Well, the House has time to work on it. If we pass it, the House can expand on it if they're yeah. willing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I don't, they, um, but there's also time to continue to work on it because this bill has to go to appropriations and finance. What I was trying to point out is there's a requirement. We voted out. It automatically goes to appropriation and finance. So, so that's two stops in that week after I guess crossover. The question I would have is does, given the shape that it's in and the fact that there are some issues in there that I'm not so sure are easily settleable, does Michelle even have time to put it into a, a, a format? that we could actually vote on. I guess that's a bridge we'll cross when we come to it. I mean, I think in terms of uh, Mr. Hughes' proposal, I think you would just need to uh, go through, you know, section by section, line by line, understanding, you know, what's in there, what needs, further refinement, what are you comfortable with from a policy perspective? You'd wanna hear from the banking and the finance folks. Um, I'd probably wanna bring David Hall in because that's really his area um, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So um, I can certainly, you know, uh, be the GC and kind of figuring out you know, because I've got the timeline. I don't think it's our stuff. expertise to go through the banking and the, we can do Right, the so that's, that's what that proposal is. It's about loans, right. low interest loans and grants, and how do you determine right. who's eligible? And that's okay. all. Yeah. Well, this has been a great meeting, Peggy. Um, and I think it's, uh, I think we're pretty well finished. 